So years ago, I used to write sermons and I used to read them to Roland uh, as bedtime stories because they always put him to sleep. And his complaint was always the same, uh, you need more jokes. So in honor of Roland, I, I put a joke in this message such this morning. So uh, how many country singers does it take to change a light bulb? It takes six, one to change it and five to sing about how much they miss the old one. And, and how many Baptists does it take to change a light bulb? I don't know, 15, but they need three committees and they've got to decide who's bringing potato salad. And, 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 and how many Anglicans does it take to change the light bulb? Well, none, because they use candles, right? So, uh, so and, and, and you know what? We, we have all kinds of Baptist and Anglican friends and, and they all come out on Thursday nights and we're just teasing. But yeah. anyway. these, these are old jokes and when we were younger, we knew hundreds of them. And some of them were better than others. And sometimes we joked about young people, and sometimes we joked about old people, and sometimes we told jokes about Newfies and French Canadians. And, and, and those kind of jokes, well, they're not very appropriate today, are they? And, and they really shouldn't be. And, and the young people today, they say it's not enough not to be racist, you need to be anti-racist. And I kind of like that. I like the idea of believing it's not enough to passively believe something, you need to be actively engaged in your beliefs. I mean, we teach that about Jesus. It is enough to believe in Jesus and you're saved, but then you have to actively follow him, right? Speaking of young people, how'd the hipster burn his hand? Uh, he was changing light bulbs before it was cool. But okay, no more, no more. I read, I read hundreds of these as I was preparing for this, and I actually took some out because there was way too many. Um... But, but I, I respect the idea of that it's not enough to passively believe something. You need to be actively engaged in, in your beliefs. Uh, Jordan Peterson says, action is the manifestation of beliefs. In other words, you act out what you believe. Everything you do, you do because you believe something about that. Now, sometimes we don't always do the things that we think are going to right. I mean, sometimes we violate your own morals, right? I mean, that's what sin is. And, that, and when that happens, we repent and we strive to do better. But if you didn't believe differently, then you wouldn't act differently. I mean, if you think it's okay to tell, tell Newfie jokes, you would never stop telling them, would you? But if you believe that, if you believe that it's uh, still too dangerous to go out in public without a mask, then you'd still be wearing your mask and that's okay. Because we act on our beliefs. That's a direct result of your beliefs. And if you believe that Jesus is alive and Jesus is God, then you're going to live accordingly. Say that again. If you believe that Jesus is alive and Jesus is God, you are going to live accordingly. So I want to ask you this morning, does your life reflect Jesus? No, I'm not asking if you're sinless or perfect because none of us are. We all sin. And the harder you try not to sin, the more apparent your sin becomes. Things that you thought were fine when you were younger, you, you probably find offensive now because as you grow and mature, you realize and you change. And we are all wretched sinners in need of a forgiving grace of God. And I know I am. And I know I need to do better. And I know I need to love deeper and to grow closer to God. And I know many of the decisions I make are based on that fact. The fact that I know Jesus is real. And that knowledge informs the decisions I make. And even when I, even when I sin, the fact that I recognize I've done wrong and want to do better is based on that knowledge of who Jesus is. But my question for you is, does your belief in Jesus affect how you live? You know, ever since Easter, we, we've, been, uh, we've been thinking about the question, what would you do if you saw Jesus? Yeah, we, we took a week off last week and we talked about mothers, but, but even in that we were asked, what if you saw Jesus? What if Jesus spoke to you? How would that change your life? 
What if you saw direct evidence of the Holy Spirit active in somebody else's life? How would that change how you live? As I got two weeks ago. It was actually three weeks ago. I challenged everyone to live out your faith by doing something uncomfortable. By doing something hard. By doing something weird. By doing something challenging in order to grow the kingdom of God. And after that service, I walked in the rain to every house in St. Lawrence that had a uh, sidewalk in front of it and handed out invitations to the Mother's Day service. And I went to almost every house. Well, I didn't go to Carolyn's house because she was here that day, so I didn't think I needed to invite her because <laughs> she already had an invitation and she took home with her. And then there was, there, there was one, other, one other door I didn't want to knock on. I didn't want to knock on this other door because I, I was afraid the people wouldn't and the people that lived inside wouldn't want to see me. I thought they might get upset with me. Because, you know, I used to work with this person. And, and now that I'm in management, I thought they, they, they wouldn't want to see me at all. And I didn't want the confrontation because I, I was happy going door to door and inviting people to church. I wanted to talk about Jesus. And I thought it would be best if somebody else knocked on that door. So I walked by. And I knocked on another one. And another one. And the Holy Spirit kept convicting me, go back, go back. So, so I went back, and I knocked on the door, and I was really uncomfortable, but I, I felt I was doing what God wanted me to do. And as I knocked on that door, even though I didn't want to, well, nobody opened it anyways. Nobody was home. But I still felt I had to obey Jesus, and that meant doing something that I didn't want to do. It meant doing something uncomfortable. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 11. If you have your Bible with you. If you, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, let us know and we will get you one um, next week. But uh, turn, turn in the Bible, you have that Acts chapter 11. And here we see Peter has returned from preaching the gospel to Cornelius. Now, not only was Cornelius a Gentile, he was a Roman commander. He was the enemy of the Jewish people. He was the kind of guy that people really didn't think that God could love. He was the type of guy that people didn't want to invite to church. I'm going to ask you, and I want you to reflect on this. You don't have to answer it out loud, but I want you to answer it in your heart. Is there any type of people that you don't want in your church? And honestly, that, that, that's a real question, and it's a really hard question. There's some people that we find hard, we, we, we find difficult to believe that God loves. I, I personally find it hard to believe that God loves people that work in the insurance industry. <laughs> on, on a personal level, I feel buying insurance. My father works in insurance. It's betting against yourself. And I feel coerced to do it. It's illegal not to have insurance, and then I gotta overpay for it. How can Jesus love someone like that? Really? I think you need to talk to my father. Right. In the early church, the apostles honestly believed that Jesus died only for the Jewish people. Because everything they had been taught about God was that God chose them and they were special. Their identity was completely wrapped up in being the people of God. The thing that set them apart as Jewish people was that, that God loved them. And that set them apart from all other people in the world and it especially set them apart from the Roman Empire that was, that was abusing them. Because they were the people who knew the true God. See, the Romans had all kinds of, of, of gods that they worshipped, but the Jewish people believed that they were the only people that knew the true God. So even after Jesus died on the cross to forgive sins, even after Jesus rose from the dead and presented himself to his disciples and to many other people, even though the Jewish leaders were persecuting the church and killing Christians, the first Christians believed that salvation was for Jewish people alone. And this belief was manifest in their action. And that action was only preaching Jesus to other Jewish people. And that changed when God came to Peter in a vision and called him to go and preach to Cornelius. 
And Peter obeys Jesus' call in his life. And he takes some other church leaders. And they go to Joppa and share Jesus with this Roman Gentile. And this is recorded in Acts. In fact, the vision is, is recorded twice. So anytime we see anything repeated, we know that we better pay attention to it. We get an idea of how important this moment is in the history. See, Peter was preaching the gospel to Cornelius, and that changed the world. It, it, it was truly ear I mean, it was truly radical. And, and, and none of us would be here this morning that Peter had not obeyed God. God called Peter to Joppa. And Peter went and shared Jesus. And he baptized this Gentile oppressor of his people. You gotta, you gotta keep in mind who the Romans were. They were oppressing the, the Jewish people. And Cornelius was a commander in the Roman army. And Peter preaches the gospel to him and he's baptized. Not only did he baptize him, he, he, he baptized the man's entire household. Not just his wife or, or more likely wives and children, but his entire household, his family, his employees, his slaves, anyone connected to Cornelius was baptized that day. And the Holy Spirit came on them physically and observably. In fact, the Holy Spirit came on them the very same way that it had come on the apostles themselves. And there was no way for Peter to reject or deny the fact that Cornelius and his family had received the Holy Spirit. And Peter praises God that these sinners are forgiven, that the Holy Spirit is active in their lives. The household of Cornelius has believed in their hearts and confessed with their mouths that Jesus is Lord and are saved. Peter has experienced the power of God in the home of Cornelius. Now let's look at Acts chapter 11, verse 1. Then the apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So Peter went up to Jerusalem. The circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter's loving Jesus. Peter's living Jesus. Peter's sharing the joy of the Lord with his neighbors in Joppa. And then he gets called up to Jerusalem. And the circumcised believers criticized them and they said, you went into the house of an uncircumcised man and ate with them. See, the church was criticizing Peter for obeying God. They were convinced that Peter had done something wrong. They honestly believed that Peter did something sinful because good Jewish people wouldn't associate with those kinds of people. They wouldn't eat with those kind of people. So I'm going to ask you again, who is those kind of people in your life? Are there people in your life that you think you're a little bit better than? Are there people in your life that you don't associate with? You know, maybe maybe you think you're too good to talk to, to meth addicts. Or people of a different sexual orientation. Or people of a different social economic background. People that you think to yourself, those people are so lost. They're such sinners. They can never repent to find Jesus. I want you to honestly reflect and can you think about people like that? Because I want you to know that Jesus died for all people and Jesus loves all people. I mean, he loves you, doesn't he? And you know what you've done. Jesus loves addicts. Jesus even loves insurance agents. <laughs> Jesus loves the, the LGBTQ S plus community. There's no one that Jesus doesn't love. There is no one that isn't welcome in this fellowship. And if there's a group of people that you want to exclude from this fellowship, you're welcome to exclude yourself. Because Jesus died for everybody. Jesus loves everybody. How do you write to us from John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35? 
A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now this is Jesus talking to his disciples at the Last Supper. These are the very same apostles that are questioning Peter for sharing the gospel with Cornelius. These are the parting words to Jesus' disciples before he goes to the cross. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's how the church is called to function. Love one another. Love people who are different. Love people who are boring. Love people who are weird. Love one another. Acts chapter 11, the apostles and the believers went through Judea and they heard the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So Peter went up to Jerusalem. The circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went to the house of an uncircumcised man and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, and I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was, and I looked into it and I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, birds, and I heard a voice from God saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat, and I replied, surely not, Lord, nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. And the voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clear, clean. This happened three times. It was pulled up to heaven again. This is the second time Peter's vision is recorded in Acts. It's a big deal. And the, and the point of the vision isn't about what's clean and unclean for people to eat. It isn't about food laws. It isn't about religion at all. The point of the vision is made clear in verse 9. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Let's compare that to the John. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, I know I say this a lot, but it is it's very true. Love is not the same as tolerance. You can love someone and know that they are wrong. Sometimes loving someone means telling them that they need to repent. Jesus loves everyone. And his message was repent for the kingdom of God has come near. Loving someone doesn't mean that you accept everything about them. It means you love them even though you disagree with them. I mean, you, you can honestly and, and truly believe the marriage is between one man and, and, and one woman for life and still share the love of Jesus with somebody who doesn't have that same belief. I mean, we, we, we love people that we disagree with all the time. I mean, I disagree with Heidi about how to load a dishwasher, but that doesn't mean I can't still love her. Thanks. The point is not accept everyone as they are. The point is don't call anything impure that God has made clean. Because there's no one that Jesus didn't die for. And there's no one that Jesus can't forgive. And there's no one that Jesus doesn't love. There is one that we... There is no one that is not called to share the joy of the world with. There is no one that we are not called to serve Jesus by serving their needs. And sometimes it's hard. I told the story this morning about a time when it was hard just this week, or last of all, this month. Sometimes we don't know the best way to do it. Sometimes we need to fully rely on the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. 
As soon as Peter had finished seeing his vision, right then three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea to stop at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us that he had seen an angel appear at his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter, and he will bring you a message, which you and all your household will be saved. So while the Holy Spirit was preparing Peter to preach, he was preparing the hearts of these Gentiles to hear the word of God. Every week we pray that the Holy Spirit moves in St. Williams and prepares hearts for the message of the gospel. And every one of you is called to share the joy of the Lord. And we need to pray that the Holy Spirit works in people's hearts and minds so that they are receptive to that message. Here we see the Holy Spirit active not only in the hearts and lives of the preacher, but also in the hearts and the lives of the listener. Verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit come on them. Ah, no. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave him the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? If God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think I could stand in God's way? Who are you to stand in the way of God? Who are you to judge who can come to Jesus and who can't? For a long time, Christians have done a poor job of sharing the love of Jesus with certain groups in our society. For a long time, we've tried to stay pure in the name of holiness. We try not to associate with people that Jesus loves and died for. We got an attitude about attending funerals of people that Jesus loved and died for. Do not share the joy of the Lord with those people, wherever those people are. And now we have a, a society that doesn't want to hear from the church. Because the church has not shown love to them the way that Jesus loves them. Whoever this group is that you have identified in your, your heart and in your mind, you need to do a better job of sharing the love of Jesus. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit not only gives us opportunities to share the joy of the Lord with them, but the Holy Spirit prepares their hearts for His message of love. And we need to share and model the love of Jesus. Because of action truly is the manifestation of belief. Do you believe that Jesus died for everyone? Is that just something you say? Jesus loves everyone. He died for all sinners. Well, he died for you and he died for me and, 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 and we all know what we've done. And he died for, for the attic and the, the 2S plus community and he even died for the, the father-in-law who works in the giant insurance company. Jesus died for liberals and conservatives and truckers and politicians and, and anybody else we can think of that we don't necessarily think that Jesus could love. So if God gave them that gift that he gave us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? Who are we to question who Jesus loves? Our job is to reflect Jesus. Who said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Peter explained that to the church and the apostles. That the Holy Spirit had poured out on these Gentiles. The 
prophecy of Jesus had been fulfilled in front of Peter's eyes. That Cornelius and his family had come to Jesus. And when they heard this, there was no further objection. And praising God, saying, So then, even the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. I hope that's our response when we hear about people coming to Jesus. I hope that's your prayer as, as you try to reach St. Williams for Jesus. So then, even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So then, even to people that, that don't like us, God has granted repentance to lead to life. So then, the, even the people that we disagree with, God has granted repentance that leads to light. So then, even people that we might not like, God has granted repentance that leads to light. So then, even to you, God has granted repentance that leads to light. Fellowship of Joy exists to share the joy of the Lord with this community and to serve Jesus by serving our neighbors. And that's all our neighbors. Regardless of their, their lifestyle, regardless of their choices, regardless of, 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 of who they are and what they do, following Jesus means this. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. If you believe that, it will be manifest in your actions. A few minutes ago, I asked how many country singers it takes to change a light bulb. And we talked about one to change it and five to sing about how they long for the old ones. Well, the church sometimes spends too much time longing for the old days, longing for the old ways. We need to turn a light on and see how much, even though it seems like the world changed, one thing remains the same. Our, our neighbors need Jesus. And we're called to share that love. Like Jesus said to his disciples at the Last Supper, a new commandment I give you, Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray that we love one another. And we pray that we love our neighbors. And we pray that we serve you by serving our neighbors. We pray for forgiveness for the times that we've, we've been harsh in our judgment and not shared your love. And we pray for opportunities to, to love our neighbors better. We pray that your Holy Spirit softens hearts, prepares people to hear your gospel of love, and that we share your gospel of love and joy with this community. We pray for the upcoming uh, barbecue and community garden, and that you will bless conversations and give opportunities to share your love. This town. We love and praise you, Lord Jesus, because you taught us how to love. So we pray in Lord Jesus Christ's name.